This is Off Planet Radio. You know, they say that the best way to impart a truth is to tell a story. And uh, that's kind of what we are as people. We're, we're storytellers. We are stories. We are unfolding stories. We are a narrative that spins itself out <clears throat> onto the landscape of the reality we inhabit. I had an old friend of mine visit me a couple weeks ago. And he sat down in my summer room and he sat he was sitting in a rocking chair across from me and he looked at me and he said, Tell me a story. There are no people, there's just stories. And that, that was a, kind of a very interesting way to start a conversation with an old friend that I hadn't seen in a while. And I think our guest tonight kind of encapsulates that as well. The idea that maybe the best way to impart truth is through stories that have a lot of truth to them. But in bringing something out in a story, it's a lot like it's a lot like film. It's a lot like music, in that the mind relaxes just enough for the receptors to open up and that little shaft of light to shoot in. And so, um, I'm going to introduce you to somebody who's new to our show. He is an emerging, I will say, emerging profile on the landscape of what I shudder to call alternative media but for lack of a better word, I'll use it here. And uh, he's, uh, he's prolific. He's putting out a lot of material. He's piercing through the darkness with a light beam. He uses his own life, his own experiences, which are massive, to generate a field of truth that people can kind of begin to walk in. Uh, he has a huge amount of background, including uh, his education as a Bachelor of Arts of Philosophy, fiber optics in the U.S. Navy, um, wilderness first responder, software engineer, augmented, re augmented reality coder, which we're going to talk about because I really want to talk about AI. He's also a sculptor, an illustrator, a writer, and uh, apparently a first responder uh, in terms of wilderness first responders, which is interesting, is a massive backlog of... Uh, software languages and platforms that he's mastered so he's definitely a binary person and uh, we want to introduce you for the first time here on off planet radio to our new friend james true welcome to off planet thank you that was a, a enlightening introduction uh, <laughs> actually the first part about divining truth uh, through stories that's really well said i might have to steal that from my go ahead it's all open source <laughs> we're open source here it's, well, it's great to be here thanks it's good to have you on. Um, when, I, when I first started to uh, look at what you were doing, I did a couple of things. I looked at your website, your blogs, obviously, and uh, went out and grabbed your books. And we'll just mention here the two books that uh, you have out. Tell people, tell people about that and tell people where they can find you right off the front. Sure. Uh, I published my first book uh, on Halloween of last year. It's a personal story and autobiography. It kind of describes what all of us go through, which is uh, we get hit in the board, uh, get hit in the face with a board of, of what, what's really happening in our world. So um, that, that first book is basically just a compilation of, of 10, 15 years of writing that I compiled um, into a book because I decided I've always wanted to write. I, I wonder if the world will will greet me as a writer. So that's called the spell of six dragons. Um, and again, that was in October. Um, and then just two weeks ago, um, I finished my second book, which is, uh, I, I think your readers might like that better simply because of the topics you discuss. It's called blueprints of mind control. And it's basically, uh, two years of my, um, of my, my column, um, sort of like picking the best columns that seem to, to move people the most, and I refined those columns. I added a few more things in case some of my readers have already seen my columns. I wanted to give them something else to, uh, to find in the book. Um, and just, you described it perfectly. It, it's, it's an attempt to reach people through the literary device rather than a factual device. 
it's an attempt to, if I was to give myself away, it would be that I am wandering around the world emotionally trying to convince people to look at the world differently, not through intellect, not through facts, purely through emotion. And it, it's, I only do that, I think, uh, because the machine is eating all of us right now. It's eating every single one of us. And it's almost like all we have left is our emotions, is the way that we uh, feel about something. And if, if I can find a way to spark that passion in someone else, it's going to come back and make me want to be more passionate. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see them leading, and I'm going to want to catch up. And so I feel like it's a, a really good uh, vortex energy to, uh, to help spread and, and you know, help, help wake more people up, basically. Sorry, just move it up there for a second. Um, yeah, well, I, what I really like about what you're doing is you do per, you personify it. And I won't diminish the first book because that's the book I spend a little bit more time with, just because you know time's short and I needed to, I needed to get through some of your material because I wanted a sense of your voice. I wanted to know who you were. Um, you've done some interviews. Like I said, you are emerging, you're getting out there. And what I liked about Spell Six Dragons was that it was very much your journey. And it, what, a, what a ride it's been, as, as the Grateful Dead once said, what, what a long, strange trip it's been. Um, you've, you've, you cover a lot of ground in that book on an emotional scale, and you put yourself out there perfect, personally, which is something we we have been indoctrinated into what I will call the spellcraft of the researcher. And while I don't diminish the work of many of the great researchers that are out there and that have gone before us and that are presently working, we've gotten caught up in the hegemony of um, fact-finding, verifications, proofs, and an endless linear narrative that has really not gotten us very far. It was one of my frustrations with ufology, which is why I sort of moved out of ufology, was because I saw the, the trench it was stuck in. It was stuck in this trench of attempting to prove things that in my experience and in my view aren't provable and verifiable through the normal senses. And my frustration with, with it is now that it's so schismatic, because on the one hand we have, a, then this is, even goes into the mind control. We have experiencers on one side who can only give us their testimony. On the other side, we have the researchers who can only give us hard facts, most of which they've called from established sources. In the middle of this, we have a theater, which includes, I will just say the TV version, without naming names here, that has become ridiculous and spewed out and distorted in so many ways that now the narrative is basically just melted down and nobody knows where to go in this. So the beauty of what you're doing here is, as you said, reaching people on an emotional level, allowing them to begin to receive what I consider to be their own truth. Because really, isn't that what we're doing? We're trying to bring people to the place where we're not asking them to believe, we're asking them to know. Yeah, we're asking them to look. We're asking them to ask questions yeah. that their entire life they've been either shamed or famed into not asking. That they've, they're going to have a certain peer pressure on them to not even consider. And I think that's actually part of why uh, emotional is such a good approach because um, and it's really astute what you said about the vulnerability because I think that's a key. It, the way that we bond, um, whether or not we want to admit it or not, the way we make deep connections is, is we, we become vulnerable in front of each other. And so I, I'd like to think that the Spell of Six Dragons is showing people, wow, look at how, <laughs> look at how vulnerable I am on page seven. You know, or look at, at this or look yeah. at that. And I'm hoping, that it, I'm not even just hoping, I really think that the people that seem to comment and like my work, I'm under the impression that they like that I'm being vulnerable with them. They like that I'm establishing that rapport with them up front. I'm coming in right off the front saying, look, here's my $20. You know, I'm, here's my deposit. You know, <laughs> here's how vulnerable I've, I've been. And yeah. it's only from there that we can establish a rapport. 
where neither one of us are trying to impress each other by how, how well we know the research or, or how long we've been in the game or how much, you know, how many heads we've, we've chopped off and put on our board. It's, it's not about that. It's more about, I'm at a place of frustration and I want to meet you there uh, because we can have a communion there. It sounds like a bad place to meet at frustration. People are like, oh, you shouldn't do that. But that's actually exactly where you should meet. That, that's anger. I was just, just complaining about this the other day. There, there's such a, a tendency to, to shame anger, in fact, you know. And mm, you know, yeah, you yeah. You need to learn how to be cool, man. You need to learn how to accept your feelings better. You need to learn how to reject and let love and light in. And, and the whole time you're like, yeah, but we could be fixing stuff. Like we could be taking this anger and using it constructively instead of pretending like we are not allowed to have it or that we're somehow lower or more reptilian to even have it. It's yeah. Such an even misnomer because people are even claiming that anger is something a reptile would have. And it's not, you know, a, a reptile is going to have a baby and the mom is going to be sitting on the rock and her child's going to accidentally walk in front of her and boom, that child's gone. There's no anger in the mom eating the lizard there's there's no remorse there's no thought it's simply the way it is it, it's there's no emotion at all emotions are what make us real they don't make us weak or vulnerable or bad they make us alive human dimensional deep so you know i, I want to spin that i want to let's stop pretending like we're bad let's let's take these things that we're labeling as bad but actually realize these are good things anger is kick ass man it gets you off your feet it gets you thinking it gets you trying to solve it a gets people's attention and it gets people's attention absolutely yeah, yeah you know you actually drive this in an interesting place and i told you we're kind of free gonna 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 freewheel this great because i think that i think the best way to go with a conversation like this is just bounce off of each other and see if we, we have some sparks. But you just, you just zeroed in on something that contextualized something I've been thinking about. So this, this whole anger thing, which I deal with, and I, I've dealt with my anger from the toxic standpoint. I'll park that word there because I'm going to come back to it. I came to understand that I had and still do have a fairly high level of anger that occasionally externalizes through triggers and my own emotional aspects that I'm still dealing with. Because as humans, we've all been traumatized, we've all been triggered, and we're all dealing with the shit that's inside of us, some of which we still don't even know is there. We're dealing with that. And yet at the same time, that's an energy like any energy you can modulate, you can use to springboard into a higher level. So what I understand about my anger is that I'm not an angry person. I'm a person who has a certain level of anger, some of which needs to be modulated and some of which needs to be channeled. So the reason I put the toxic there is because there's this whole conversation going on about toxic masculinity. Mm -hmm. It's all over the place. And um, to my regret, I have not published the articles I've written. I just don't have the time right now to edit down and publish the way I'd like to. But I did some, did some writing over the beginning of the year responding to this Gillette Razor commercial, the best you can be with this choreographed spin art of the classic toxic male and how we need to readapt that into a softer, more acceptable mode. Some of which I don't disagree with, except that all of this is agendized. So when I'm dealing with this media aspect right now, I'm seeing this really divisive conversation about men and masculinity and toxic masculinity like only only men only masculinity is toxic whereas if we reframe that conversation we have to say that our culture is toxic and that we're all responding to external triggers that have formed us this is men women children the whole culture dealing with a toxicity that comes not from inside of us, but where 
we were triggered initially through the traumas. And I don't care if your trauma was that you got ran over by your grandfather's lawnmower when you were three years old, or if somebody grabbed you off the street and raped you. They, these are traumas. These are things that trigger us. They're things that are deep inside of us. So I'm wondering how you see the culture evolving now in terms of all this polarity and the obvious attacks on, we'll say, traditional role models and on the structure of our culture. Where do we need to go at this point? How do we get to a place where we're real with each other again, emotionally, where men actually can be emotionally open without also becoming let's just say overly feminized we're going to have to <clears throat> rebuild culture we have to reject all culture right now uh case in point uh toxic uh water is toxic anything in too much the definition of toxic is something that's too much that's literally just what the word means. If you give something too much of something, at a certain point, that threshold becomes toxic. And so something that even could be good for you can still be toxic if it's given in enough, uh, in enough dosage. Anger is a natural, healthy reaction to injustice. When you experience injustice, if you are healthy, you will feel anger from that. You will uh, feel cheated from that. You will leave feeling like you have lost a piece of yourself in this fray. If you broadcast that across culture, we are looking at millions of men that are purposely led to, to become angry through programming and then told, wow, you are so broken. Look, look at the emotions that are rising from you because of this. And so what, what you end up happening is, is that everybody in America has their assemblage point. They have their focus, their, their needle on the record is outside of their body. It is instead in this uh, pretend psychic world where there's this like supreme Jedi council of people. And they're the ones that are dictating whether or not you've, you've done well. And it's as long as we have that situation, as long as we have the hive colony installed, we are never going to be okay um, because the only thing that's going to be okay in that situation is the hive. The hive is doing really well. Um, our genders are now blurring. Um, our identities are blurring. This is what a hive does. When a drone is born, it can be assigned to be a worker or a drone. I'm sorry, when, when a young bee is born, it's assigned a duty. Um, the only bees that are rejected are the ones with white eyes. It's weird. These there are certain bees that are actually born. They have a distinguishable white eyes and beekeepers will typically throw them out. Um, at least I think so. Beekeepers forgive me because I'm not a beekeeper. But the point is, is that these are reject bees. And why? Because they can see <laughs> they have a mm. kind of vision. They're, they're oh. responding to the white light and it's reaching them. And so they are buzzing from a different place. And that's why when you see them leave a bee, you know, 500 will go to the, to the West. You know, there's a, colony of pollen at 12 o'clock this guy's like hey look there's a butterfly and he's totally going in a different way he's not <laughs> he's not servicing the hive he's servicing himself now from a beehive perspective that's terrible and that's why he's not welcome back that's why he's rejected he's pulled from the hive he's a he's a reject but we're not a beehive i don't want us to be a beehive i don't want us to be bees that are in a collective i want us to be freestanding men and to be freestanding men, we have to stop putting our assemblage point outside and putting it in something else. We have to put it back in ourselves. But the second we put it back in ourselves, we're instantly felt, we're instantly engulfed in this guilt because we're angry or because we have emotion or because we're men. Um, men especially. It, I, 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 I joined a men's group like last year in my book, I went through some depression stuff with some personal loss stuff that actually helped me with programming. But in that, yeah. I went through like a really deeper depression. I went through therapy. It, it didn't work. Two years later, I'm broke. So I can't go to therapy. I go to men's group. You know, I'm sort of like using these men to kind of get free therapy. I kept walking in there noticing this is not a men's group. This is a, this is a female group that have penises. Like, 
we, we were men sitting in this room, but we were behaving as if women were watching us. We, we, were, we were conducting ourselves in this pattern that is more like what you- Shame-based. See, it, it, it's shame-based. It's everything based. based. Yeah, it, it's, it's kicking Guilt, you out shame. of your body and, and, yeah. and just function on this different level where, where again, you're a member of the hive. You're everything yeah. about being polite. And the whole time I'm in the group, I'm like, why aren't, why aren't we touching the dirt? Why aren't we have a fire? Like, why are we not, why can't we meet outside <laughs> and let the girls meet inside? Like, why does this make us who we are by coming to this building that we've built for women, men, and children to come in and congregate? But we're going to pretend like this is how we function. It, it's, it's such a strong pressure that we don't even know it's there. We, we, you don't even know that it's okay, that it's not okay to be a man in America. You, you just don't even know that. It's just, you just assume you're not okay. And that's where the dissonance comes in. You, you're walking around stuck in your head, above your neck, actually. Uh, you know, we're taught we're heads in jars. We're kicked out of our bodies completely. We're kicked out of our genitals from a very young age, whether it be through circumcision, or we're kicked yep. out just from toxic shame, you know, just as we've described about, well, you're angry. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be angry. We're kicked out of our other emotional centers in our body. You know, we're a trinity. We've, we've got our mind, but, but that's only one decision center. We've got a heart with, covered in neurons. It's surrounded in neurons. It's its own brain. And then we've got our gut brain. Science is already waking up to this now that, that the, we're a trinity of three different decisions, but we're programmed as if we're one. And we're completely shown over and over again. Yeah, man, you're a head in a jar. Disney put his head in a jar. Here's a cartoon yeah. about a head in a jar. Yeah. Here's a sci-fi yeah. movie about head in a jar. It, they want us convinced that our brain is everything. You know, people are always saying, oh, the brain is amazing. The brain's a Wi-Fi router. It's, it's an electrical router. That's all it freaking does, guys. Our memories are not in our head. I, I can prove Boom. it. Anyone exactly. Who, anyone who gets an organ transplant is going to have these massive uh, memory shifts. They're going to have yes. desires, different emotions. I, until we get back in our bodies and until it's comfortable to sit back in our bodies, we are screwed. I, I don't mean that to sound negative. It's just that <clears throat> until we're allowed to do that, I don't think we have any hope because we're going to be serving the hive more. We're going to see more fluidity. I think, you know, what we're seeing now with gender fluidity and age fluidity, which is something we don't talk about. There's actually an age dysphoria happening too. If you go on campuses, for example, you'll see a 19 year old acting like a seven year old. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's all around the board like that. <clears throat> and eventually see uh, dysphoria with, um, with our names, like even our own identity. Um, look at the word prejudice. Prejudice is not a bad word. Like the word prejudice picks out a lane in traffic. It picks out a parking space. It picks yes. out a shirt you're going to wear in the morning. It's your, it picks out your favorite song to put under your yearbook. Prejudice is the raw ability for us to have a style, to have, to make a decision. And that's the expression of our identity. It's literally prejudice is our identity. If, if we weren't allowed to make free choices, if we weren't allowed to prejudice and to choose things, we wouldn't actually be who we are. We wouldn't be able to express ourselves. So even yeah. the word prejudice is this mind cult that's like, dude, you can't even define yourself right. Like you're not even capable of making your own choices because they're going to be that racist or that sexist or or that this or that that. It's just a constant barrage from every sector to get out of your body, man. Get out. Because no matter what you choose, it's going to be wrong. Yeah, it's one of, the, one of the problems that I have right now with these identity movements, whether it's social justice warriors. And I mean, I've gone through the civ on this. I've been on both sides of these arguments, a lot of them. I mean, I grew up in the era immediately following the civil rights movement. I remember the times when people were oppressed over race, gender, sexual preference, all of that. I get that. But what I see now is that the highest status that people can attain is their special version of victim. And that's this victimization mindset then does exactly what you're talking about as well. It pigeonholes us into our victimization so that we're categorized and sorted. Thus, we become 
I guess, subhives in all of this with a special, special purpose, special branding put on us in a way to identify us, but it's not me anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody, everybody says, I just want to be uniquely who I am. And yet the most conformist thing in the world that I see is the group identity that takes on this, this grotesque kind of mindset of the same things. And, and the, you know, the transgender, the gender fluid movement and, and recognize my pronouns and, I'm like, I get that you probably don't feel like you fit in, but you know something? I don't either. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like I fit in. And I never felt like I fit in. And I think reading your work, you really didn't feel like you fit in either. And that was what was kind of the interesting side of the whole trip. Yeah, I think that's been the, the biggest catalyst for all of us is to have, is to have rejection. But we're taught in society you can never reject anything. You 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 know you have to accept everything's about diversity is our strength. You know stuff like that. It, it's 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 always constantly constantly pushed on us. And so as long as we're as long as we're kind of lost in that in that blindness, again we're not going to be able to get back into our body because we're slipping into a a room where where we're being told well you can choose whatever your gender you want. This is your prejudice. See look here's a spectrum. Put your arrow anywhere you want on there. You see, you are an individual. You, you get to define what gender you are. You get to define, you know, what you're attracted to, what you're not. We're, we're being, it's no different than the federal government. They're like, let's take all the state taxes, let's sieve them out, and then we're going to give them back to the states after we've had our say-so with them. It's the same thing happening with our prejudice, with our own free will, with our own choices. It's, it's everything's blocked off and walled. Nope. Can't say anything about race. Can't say anything about this. Can't say anything about this. Can't even be too male. Can't even be too female. But you have free spectrum to just be dysphoric. So, you know, whatever it is you're going to go into, just, just melt and go with it. Meanwhile, no one is allowed to question, which I did question in one of my chapters, that eugenics, that LGBT is a eugenics program. Yep. It's, it's you, literally, if you look at every letter in the LGBT community, and I'll give you that, that bisexual, that one maybe doesn't fit, but think about it, lesbian, gay, trans, all those, it's a commitment to not have kids. It's a commitment to say, I will have sex with anyone as long as it does not cause a reproductive act, as long as I do not have a child from this relationship. Now, you can have your own sense of what you're attracted to. I'm not trying to say you shouldn't do that, but I am trying to say that there's a, there's a worldwide program, nationwide, I should say. There's a nationwide program that's trying to get us. Oh, it is worldwide. I, I agree with that. Yeah, to make yeah. agreements to stop reproducing. Yeah. And none of us see that. And the times that I bring it up and say, hey, eugenics is an LGBT program, the pushback is just, I mean, it is intense. It, 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 they push back really hard against that. But it doesn't change the fact well, what do all these have in common? All of them have agreed. They've taken a, a vow of, of chastity to not reproduce until they decide not to. And then we have this culture where we're pretending like we're suppressing them, but we're not suppressing them. We're actually elevating them. They're turned into the golden child in our society, which is a form of abuse, by the way. It doesn't mean golden child has it good. But if you look at the two roles of scapegoat and golden child, you're going to find that the LGBT community is not in the role of scapegoat. They're actually elevated to golden child, whether it be by the media, by the Oscars, by the movies, by the TV, by, by our news, by everything. Even hate laws go in and say, well, sure, you punch that guy, but that's not nearly as bad because this guy's gay. Therefore, punching him is even worse. It's just, this is a privileged society. We've created a sect. We've created a, a color-coded seating chart that starts with, well, yeah. okay, you're, you know, you're fit in this category, this category, this category. Therefore, you go to the top. And everyone's assigned this different rank. This is what hives do. This is how hives program bees, not, not humans. And we're falling for it. We're we're completely following for it. But we haven't, you know, since I've been alive, I've been programmed this way. It took me until a few years ago to, to kind of go, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. And I certainly wasn't going to challenge that. 
um, at least not my old life, not, not surrounded with the people I was surrounded with because they couldn't take stuff like that. It's, it's too painful to even look at the truth right now. It's, people call it a rabbit hole, but I think truth's more of a briar patch because yeah. as I crawl through, you know, maybe the first thing I crawl through is uh, false flags. You know, wow, that hurt. As soon as you turn around to go back to the group, you realize, well, for me to get back there to them, I'm going to have to pretend like false flags don't exist. Like every time I go out to dinner to hang out with normies, I'm going to have to believe that false flags are, aren't real. Yeah, yeah. And then you push a little bit further, in the, you know, and then you go into, well, our history has been ma manipulated or uh, special relativity is actually bullshit. Like the more you uncover, the deeper you push into the briar patch, you're just, you're just losing more and more of your friends because not everybody can go as deep as you. Some people go further than you. So the truth movement is in of itself a painful uh, tearing apart of yourself, um, almost like a muscle, where if you go to the gym and you tear that muscle, the second you tear that, that muscle is actually exploding on itself. It, it's yeah. rebirthing, it's regrowing itself. But this process turns us into what looks like a monster back on the inside because if when you're back on the inside everybody's cool no one rocks the boat <laughs> no one gets angry everyone has just the right amount of spirituality to where they can just accept everything but if you're in the middle of the briar patch you're like these people eat people like they're actually baby eaters out there <laughs> like there's actually this is happening and this is happening yeah. and, and you, you you don't you lose all that um that sense of community. I mean, you still find it in the truth community, but it's harder. It's, it's, it's smaller pockets. Hopefully this is changing. Actually, I know it's changing. Yeah, it is changing. Um, you know, I, I think just because now everything's so over the top, it's becoming more and more obvious. And I don't, I don't like to call or refer to people as sheep. It's to me, I did this for a lot of years. I've been doing this since, 2003 on the internet and <clears throat> I've checked myself a couple of times going that's condescending because this is all a process but I get it too I get where you're at the point where you just go Jesus Christ will they ever wake up are they ever going to pull the fucking blinder off their eyes and see what's plainly in front of them mm -hmm. and I'd like to think that we've been living in the, a, a, a broadening spectrum of awakening that's come, come in. It's not the love and light shit. That's like, that's an inversion. That's the weaponized version. But it is a heightened awareness that humanity has been on this arc since I was a little kid. And I know you lost your father to Vietnam. I, I heard you tell that story. Um, as a little kid, I grew up watching Vietnam on TV. And the only thing that I knew about that was it was wrong and that I couldn't be that. And it created a huge schism with my father. I mean, I spent several decades pretty much estranged from my own father over the fact that when I told him, I said, if they're still drafting for this war and I'm old enough, I won't go. They can shoot me. Um, he considered me a coward until later in his life when the scale started to fall off of him, when he was old enough to realize that his stint in Korea was a caper too. When he realized that that war was nothing more than a pretext for the military industrial complex. So I watched even my own father come to terms with this late in life. And, you know, that's, a, that's a something that you were deprived of because of what happened with your father. And, and you write about this and you talk about this. But this is how our natures have been weaponized against us. You know, and, and I'm, not say, I'm not excluding females here, and I don't want to. But at least up until the 1980s, men carried the burden of this ongoing slaughter that has been the entire history of this United States construct. And nobody wants to hear this because on Memorial Day, they want to throw the bunting out. They want to fly the flags. They want to march the veterans down the street. They want to celebrate the 4th of July. They want to shoot off the firecrackers. 
And nobody stops to think that there's nothing but a river of blood that's run through the history of the United States from the very inception, and that has always been in the interest of something other than our own sovereignty, because nobody's really ever fucking attacked us. Mm -hmm. And and you tell somebody that, what I just unfolded to you, I've told people before, and they just look at me and they go, no, that's wrong. This is a great country. We're the freest people in the world. And I'm going, no, you live in one of the most controlled societies that have ever been engineered on planet Earth. (laughs) I tell you, the... uh... If you if you raise someone their whole life telling them they live in the land of the free, there's a good chance they're never going to question that. Like they're they're just going to think, oh, well, I live in the land of the free, therefore I'm not going to listen to an argument where someone's <laughs> suggesting that maybe I'm not free. But that goes back to your point about the sheep. Um, I I don't think there's anything wrong with calling us sheep because we are. What makes what makes humans great is what makes us controllable. Um, you know, because we're empathy computers, you know, what is it like 90% of your brain lights up when it sees another face. So it, it, it wants to participate. Um, it wants to, it wants to feel someone else's uh, reactions. Um, these things are, are crucial, but they're also what, what could be used to, to steer us around. That's what a shepherd does. A shepherd knows how to move its flock. It knows how to use the tools uh, to do that, and in the case of your dad, I think I think it's a perfect illustration. You know, your dad was was giving you the pressure as if your decision was somehow cowardly. But if you really look at that, it's like the bravest thing anyone could ever do. I mean, you, you were I'm guessing you were like 17, 18 when this happened, and so it, if you consider how much courage that took to be that young and to look at the system in the eye and go, uh, that doesn't feel right to me at all. Yet society teaches your dad and teaches you that, no, no, that's cowardly. It's actually the cowardly thing to do when in actuality it's the exact opposite. It, it's there. I, I applaud you for it. I, I wish that I would have been more woke sooner. Um, I wish more of us would, you know, would, would wake up even sooner. I, I'd like to think that's happening right now. But until then, until we're outside of our bodies, we're just going to keep being shamed that showing bravery is actually a form of, of, being cowardly just like showing anger is a sign that well maybe you need to evolve a little bit more before you know before you can come play at the big table with the rest of the the drones that kind of thing so i don't i don't consider i didn't consider then that it was brave but what i did consider was that somehow i knew that was not something i could do in this lifetime Mm -hmm. and You know, I look at things now from a very multidimensional standpoint because my entire adult life has been basically resistance against the system, which I suspect even when you were in the military, you sensed this as well. Mm -hmm. The awareness that we were being played, that we were being used for purposes that go into even occult witchcraft aspects of blood sport and sacrifice and the loosing of human energy on a scale that most people can't imagine, which then brings us into the whole mind control thing. Because Mm -hmm. the point of this is to have an army of sentient mechanized pawns to do their bidding. Mm -hmm. So what can seem brave can also seem i guess sort of like self-preservation but when we map that out and we start to look at the broad scale of it um i think what we've done is we have sent mixed messages to males and we seem to be talking more right now on this subject and i'm going to push it a little bit if you'll if you'll humor me because i don't get to have this all that often with another man is that men have been weaponized to their own destruction, emotionally, physically, and culturally, regardless of who they are as individuals. We have, as you said, and this is, this is really a bullet point for me of stepping into our bodies. We have been detached from ourselves on a psychic level and on a physical level for so long that when we wake up and i've seen this with men i've seen what they go through when they suddenly realize how 
genuinely toxic they are to themselves because of their inability to deal with themselves and other males emotionally. <clears throat> you know, and like you said, why are we sitting in chairs here? Why aren't we around a campfire? Why don't we have dirt under our nails? Why aren't we, why aren't we doing things that express a masculine form of energy or a feminine form of energy in a natural setting instead of this, this artificial construct that we're being housed in all the time. Yeah. Look at how much, how many times men smile. Like we smile yeah. a lot. And I don't think men are supposed to smile as much as we do. I, I think women are supposed to smile more. And I, I'm not trying to insist everyone gets their gender role. But what I mean is, is that women are tuned more to be social. They're, they are, they're freaking rock solid at that. Men aren't, aren't really that way. We're more of a, we're, we're more, let's get the job done. We're more task oriented. It's not a social thing as much as it's just a functioning thing. We're, we, we are fed by the functionality of what we can do, by what we can solve. But because of the mind control so bad, it's affecting even, even us. Um, I'm going to call you out on something you said earlier, uh, just because I just want to, I want to uh, show the readers just how close this gets. You, you had mentioned about your dad that, well, it was sort of, I called it brave, but you, you, you pushed back and you said, I think it was more about self-preservation. That right there is a perfect example of what I mean. There is nothing more brave in the world than preserving yourself. There is nothing that would take more courage in the world than you standing up for yourself because no one else out there is going to do it. We have this crucible that we're born with, and it's this virginity of innocence that we have that we're given from the moment we're born. Now, we're taught that we're born in sin, which is another form of mind control, but the yeah. point is that we're born, in this, we're born in this innocence. And when you were 17, you, you valued that. You understood how important that was. And that, I think that's part of why you were pushing back going, I'm not going to go. That doesn't feel right. I think personally, it's maybe you're like me, that in the back of your head, you pictured trying to walk in your own feet for the rest of your life, having to do what you would have to do to participate in the war whether it be going over there and just participating or actually shooting someone or actually taking someone's life and not even knowing who that person is or if they wronged you or, or you know, what their story is, you, you picture yourself, well, how could I live with myself for the rest of my life? And to me, that is the ultimate form of courage. That's what makes men men is that they're willing to do that. They're willing to go, I'm sorry, but self-preservation is actually courageous. It is something that, that I believe in because self-preservation means my entire moral structure, my entire moral fiber is going to be lost if I participate in your freaking war. That's why I'm not going. Now, you, if your dad wants to call that cowardly or if society wants to call that cowardly, that's mind control. That's all it is. And that's why it's so important that we just have to, we have to completely reject everything that happens out of society. It, just literally everything. And that means that we have to stop. It's almost like we have to stop talking about how it's affecting us. Like it's almost like it would be more constructive to not even discuss what was on TV that day and how that's mind controlling us. Instead, the better question is why were you watching TV? Like <laughs> what, yeah. what, what, what were you doing? You know, why were you doing that? Uh, uh, and, and to keep calling each other out, like to keep saying, no way, I think it's brave that you were self-preservational. You know, it, it's, it, this is how we're going to fix this culture is we need to, we need to encourage each other to get back in our bodies. And I think in a lot of ways, that's really what's happening with the truth movement, like on a biological level, but none of us are really looking specifically at, at what is happening because we, we just can't see this kind of energy. Like we can't see where our soul is. You know, the, like the old Aborigine people that when they would walk across the continent, they would have to wait, you know, it's like, well, now I have to wait for my soul to catch up. Like there, there maybe there's something to that. You know, if we could see, you know, we see all of our bodies in the line, they're all lined up to go to war, but where are their souls at? And, and more importantly, what color is their soul when they get back versus when they left? And then finally, the big question is, were these people brave? But like, is that, is that really brave? to agree to that, to sign your name, to, to go into the enlistment, to go to all that training, to go overseas and, and to literally close your eyes and wait for someone that you've never met, tell you, shoot that person and then do it. How, how is that brave? It, it's not. The interesting part about that is, and that's a great, 
That's a great way to put it. Um, I hadn't thought of it that way. If you look at the culture of corporations, they do the same thing. So the next stage in this was, okay, so you're a man, you've gone through, maybe you didn't go into the military, maybe you went through university or college, and then you matriculate into the corporation. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to paint this with a broad brush here. But in the 1980s, I was heavily into, I was selling to corporations, I was selling technology. And I saw the culture in corporations at that time, especially in the tech field. And I saw how these guys were road warriors, they were mercenaries, they had a mobile phone in one hand, a briefcase in the other, and they had the blood splattered polka dot tie that was the symbol. Yeah. And I watched how <laughs> the art of the deal, Mr. Trump, was painted, of how these ultra aggressive businessmen would literally sit at a conference table and cut the balls off of a competitor or another person or a person sitting across the table for 10,000, 100,000, half million dollars. Doing the bidding of their corporate warlords who sat in boardrooms and dictated the bottom line from so-called shareholder interest. Translated meaning profits, translated meaning private interests, translated meaning we were being directed inside of a corporate structure, inside of a corporate structure. Because what most people don't realize is that vertically, this entire nation slash world is a corporation. Mm -hmm. This is the way we function. And that corporations are not good things. They are another military hierarch hierarchical form of marshalling energy on a mass scale, whether it's capital, human, money, resources, in order to attain a goal that matriculates back upstream on the pyramid to the very top, which feeds the oligarchs. Mm -hmm. yep. you know, and, and in my mind, this was the evolution from I refused to be drafted to the point where I went, I can't fucking do this. I can't make a living like this. Bless you. <laughs> thank you for doing that. <laughs> Seriously, thank you for doing that. Well, and I suspect you've been in that place yourself. I've looked at your, at your CV and it, I know you've, you, it's difficult. I mean. <laughs> I've had some luck because, uh, I'd just be straight up. I don't think I'm nearly as brave as you've been. I, the things that have happened to me, I've literally just been thrown out of, off of trains j just for, <laughs> just for saying <laughs> I'm the guy that joined the, the Navy. When I was in the Navy, I went in as uh, the rank is, you know, E1, E2, E3, right? You, you raise up through the ranks. So I, I, I was enlisted as an E3 because I had college. Six years later, I left the Navy as an E3. Well, like <laughs> I did not advance one bit the entire time. <laughs> and, and this was not a matter of, of I was this rebel Fonzie, you know, in the Navy, like, hey, I'm not going to play by your rules. I was trying as hard as I freaking could <laughs> to do well. But I just kept asking questions. I, I just I just kept complaining about stuff. And it wasn't even that I thought I was complaining. I actually thought I was giving good ideas. I was under the impression. This is how I was under the impression that, that any minute someone was gonna notice, hey, this guy's really on the ball. <laughs> we should yeah. we should pick him up and promote him. And instead what I was doing is I was literally finding at, at, subconsciously what I was doing was that I was I was taking sugar and I was pouring it in every gas tank I could find as I walked but not intentionally it just I was just naturally just curious about the world and was just exposing the the I'm going to call it a satanic uh chain of command because what happens is if you're going to participate in the military you are agreeing to supplant your morality and give it to the person above you That's right. and then that person can take that morality and and give it to the person above them it, it doesn't matter it's not they pure. aggregate it's, it as they go that person's too morality yeah i mean their rank yeah, allows the them to aggregate that on higher and higher levels till you get to the top of the pyramid. Exactly. It's the same concept. And just like just like we have military uniforms, we have business uniforms. Exactly. Business uniforms have rank and the ties go from knit to silk. You know, they, they raise up too. 
we have our we have our handkerchief, which is no different than a military having their badge, you know, showing well I've competed in these. It's teams. a Masonic uniform, basically. Well, you've got the white collar. Yep. Um, plus, you're entering into the court. I really liked your bloodstain thing. That's absolutely right. <laughs> but then once you enter into a court, literally morality goes out and it's replaced by law. Yeah. And there's nothing moral about a court at all. And then you're really getting into some some esoteric. You're in a chamber of ball, man. You're, you're dealing with a dude in a black robe, yep. you know, like a ceremony. And and you walk in, you are presented. You are not. You're not even a person. You're presented as a contract, and you are taking responsibility for your contract over your legal name. Like it's, it could not get more satanic. But because we're brought up in it, because we're taught from a young age. Well, no, no. The school kids are going to hit in the rows. And then the teacher's going to be up front because the congregation is taught that way. And people just assume this is normal. But if you like, look at a Quaker church, the Quakers meet in a circle. They, right. they don't meet in rows. That's right. They meet in a big circle. They don't have a pulpit, which is actually what they harpooned whales from on a ship. Most people wow. don't get this. You, wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, where the, that's the origin of pulpit right there. Interesting. So we're bred into this satanic system 24 seven from the time we're born, but no one is, is um, not no one. Most people just the last, even if you just say the word satanic, they're just instantly like, I don't know what you're talking about. That's crazy. But, but everything there, all the signs are there, even their language, the syncretism of our language, um, all the codex that are built into what we say to each other, how we communicate to each other. It's, we are living inside of a machine. Um, because that's really what evil is. Yeah. Evil is not uh, a red beast that's dripping blood from its tongue that has a 7,000 year old uh, grudge to meet and he's going to personally find you. That's not evil. Evil is a cold, heartless machine that doesn't even know your name. It doesn't even, it doesn't know where you've been. It doesn't know what you love. It doesn't know what you hate. It's just going to eat you. And you can be the most precious thing in the world. It's going to eat you. And that's what makes it evil. It's not this other idea, you know, of this grand uh, ultra ego that, that we're, here to, we're here to fight. It's, it's, it's a, evil is a wood chipper that someone turned on and left. And there's like this wood chipper that's like running. <laughs> and anyone who drives by that's not paying attention is just going to get sucked into it. And more importantly, anyone who watches someone else get sucked into it is going to insist it didn't happen. It's just going to insist, no, hey, man, that's just the way it goes. That's just, you know, hey. What are you going to do? Everyone, what do you know? Death and taxes. Like, that's all you really know. You either die or you pay taxes. Like, this is the, this is the wisdom that we're, <laughs> that we're imparting to each other. So. Yeah, it's the inevitability of the machine. Yeah, we got we to we step away from it. We, we got, Pink Floyd gave away so much to <laughs> this lyric, Welcome to the Machine. It's, it, if you read those lyrics, it's, it's, you know, you bought a guitar to punish your ma. Uh, you didn't like school, you know, you're nobody's fool. It, it, if you really follow those lyrics, it really shows you. Oh, I lived those lyrics. I mean, literally, literally bought the guitar to punish my father yeah. in this case. Yeah. Well, that's what the machine, what's interesting about that song is that it's actually telling you, the machine's even telling you, hey man, I even know that you're going to want to buy a guitar. I even know that you're going to want to play it to punish your ma. I even, mm -hmm. I like, you were so much the property of me that what you think is this free will that you have with your emotions and your urges, even that I planned a long time ago. Yeah, sanct it's basically sanctioned rebellion. Exactly. It's and, built into it. And when you sanction rebellion, you don't have rebellion. You have recess. That's all sanctioned rebellion <laughs> is recess. That's Everyone's beautiful. I love that. Inside the chain link fence, you know, yeah. and, and it's only going to last from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. And hey, anyone listening, don't hear me as I'm not up on the pulpit here. I'm a freaking coward too. This is not me trying to say, oh, we need to all do this. And, and I already do. I, I, I catch myself every freaking day in this stuff. And th that's what we have to do. We have to be willing to catch ourselves be foolish. Because if we can, if we can handle that, that's when you start to, like, when you're exposed as being foolish, the first thing your body's going to do is climb back inside. It sounds weird, but it's actually the first thing that's going to happen because you're going to go into shock. You're going to go into like a psychic shock. Just like if you were to jump in a giant pool of cold water, you know, all of your energy is going to just soak up to your chest. Yep. Like, oh, here I am. The same thing's going to happen with your psyche. That's why when, a, it, that's why when you find 
yourself in the Navy or, <laughs> or in a clan of people that, that are mind controlling you. The second you feel that they're starting to throw you out, man, they're giving you a gift. When they throw you off that train, you're about to enter a journey that's going to suck, but it's going to put you back in your body. And once you're back in your body, if you can just stay in there for just like three days, like if you could just, even if it sucks to be in your body, just stay there, make yourself stay in your body for three or four days. The next time you go back to that click, they're all going to look a little bit different. Like they're, they're, <laughs> they're not going to be the same and you're going to be different too. And the more you do that, the more powerful you're going to get. And the poorer you're going to get because you're going to become allergic yeah. to money. You're going to become allergic to fiat. Yeah. Money is not evil, but the people who print our money are evil and they've done things with it that is very evil. That's why we don't know how many bills we have in the world. It's, we're not dealing with a real system, but again, you're going to become allergic to the system. You're not, you're, you're going to lose your job. You're going to lose your relationship. Maybe you're going to lose, you're going to lose parts of your life. And that's good. I mean, it doesn't feel like it's good. You will not believe the car I'm driving right now. It's freaking hilarious. I mean, <laughs> like I'm in the car right now and the whole car is shaking. And I used to have like a really nice Honda Pilot, you know, like really yeah. fancy uh, speakerless system, you know, like all, all kinds of fancy stuff right now. And it, it's life is different <laughs> now. But my God, I'm so much more in my body now than I've ever been. And more importantly, I, I exchanged 400 friends for like seven. And they are like badass friends. Like they were just like so freaking right on and cool. So it, it's, you know, you're doing well by how, how poorly you're doing in the satanic system. But like, that's a really good measuring device to know. Yeah, I must be doing pretty well. I just got my car repossessed, you know, or I just, you know, <laughs> things are going great. It, it's, it sounds crazy, but again, you start to rebuild that self. You start to find, I don't need all this stuff to be comfortable. I'm actually much more comfortable with this or this works out much better. So you just, you just can't abandon yourself. You have to keep going back into yourself and saying these terrible things that are happening to me is purely because I'm just allergic to, I'm allergic to bullshit. I'm allergic to evil. And that's a natural reaction. If you're allergic to something, your body's going to repel it. So go with it. That's probably a great place to park this first segment. Um, <laughs> we'll be replaying this one back again because uh, there's a lot of stuff here that's really worth chewing on for all of you. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to back out of here. We have a group of people we call our patrons, and uh, they mean a lot to us. So we try to give them some of the inside, I think we're going to maybe talk about AI a little bit and some other things that are of interest to our guest, James True. James, tell people where you, they can find you, how, what they can find, and all of the usual aspects of... Uh... Great. You can find me right here. I'm in this room. Here I am. Here's my, my stuff. No, I, I'm, I'm, on the, I'm on the web under my, my name is James True. J is in Jiggy and True is in NotFalse.com. Uh, I write a free column every week. Um, I've got two new books out and um, uh, check out my column. I, I, I tend to do a lot of uh, social research on, I mean, do a lot of research on social media because there's just so many really wise people out there that are contributing stuff. Um, so if you're interested in social media, um, I'm a pretty fun follow on Twitter, mainly just because of the gang I've accrued. Um, we just got some cool, cool things that we're researching and stuff. So uh, that's another option. Um, yeah, and join my free mailing list and buy my book. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that that that's all all good, and uh, I really have enjoyed this conversation so far. So we're gonna back it out. Say goodbye to you out there on the YouTube and the public channels. Come and join us if you like. It is uh, patreon.com forward slash Off Planet Media for not a little for not a lot of money. We will toss you the second hour and some bonus things as well. And uh, it's not really about the money. It's really about just, hey, you want to be part of the circle? There's some things we want to tell you that we don't want to put on YouTube. Do that. This is All Planet Radio. I'm Randy Moggins. The truth is out there. It's inside you. And uh, it's up to you to find it. See you on the other side. This is Off Planet Radio.